Hello, everyone, um, to, and welcome to this morning's Wednesday seminar. I would like to firstly begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of, of the land on which we meet today and, pay, and to pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. I would also like to extend that respect to any First Nations people participating in our seminar today. Welcome, and I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Christina Amastasi, and I look after the branch that is the Advice, Investment Attraction and Analysis branch here at Geoscience Australia. Before we begin, I also would like to use this opportunity to acknowledge our New South Wales participants who are currently, who are currently dealing with the flooding crisis. Please know our thoughts are with you. I am very excited and pleased to be both chairing and introducing today's seminar, which will be presented by Laura Easton and Andrew Fites. The seminar today is on mapping Australia's hydrogen future, the release of the Hydrogen Economic Fairways Tool. I would like to remind you all that today's seminar is being presented to a live audience, as well as staff in the Ragged Theatre at Geoscience Australia. It is also being broadcast via our webinar app. Now, globally, as you know, energy markets are evolving as countries seek to reduce carbon emissions and hydrogen is emerging as a key part of this evolution. As, you, as we know, hydrogen can be used for a variety of domestic and industrial purposes, such as heating and cooking as a replacement for natural gas, transportation, replacing petrol and diesel and energy storage by converting intermittent renewable energy into hydrogen. The key benefit of using hydrogen is that it is a clean fuel that emits only water vapour and heat when combusted. In 2019, the Australian Government released a national hydrogen strategy. This strategy lays out what is needed for Australia to build a clean, innovative, competitive and safe hydrogen industry. I'm pleased to say GS Science Australia was involved, involved in both the development of this strategy and we continue to be involved in supporting its implementation. And as part of our involvement and in collaboration with Monash University, we are today releasing this morning the Hydrogen Economic Fairways Tool, or HEF as people know it. HEFT is a free online tool that is designed to support decision making by policymakers and investors on the location of new infrastructure and development of hydrogen hubs in Australia. It considers both hydrogen produced from renewable energy as well as that from fossil fuels with carbon capture and storage. Shortly, you will discover HEF's capabilities and its potential to attract worldwide investment in Australia's hydrogen industry and also what's up next for hydrogen at Geoscience Australia. Now, before I pass uh, you on to the speakers, I want to introduce them. Now, first I'll start with Laura Easton. Laura is a geoscientist with a keen interest in emerging clean energy technologies. She joined the low carbon geoscience and advice section in 2020 and works to deliver online data products which promote hydrogen investment into Australia. To further her understanding of Australia's transitioning energy sector, Laura is also undertaking a master's in energy change at the Australian National University, part-time alongside her full-time work. Dr. Andrew Fines, he is an environmental engineer and is the Director of Low Carbon Geoscience and Advice team at Geoscience Australia. He has a PhD from the University of New South Wales and has worked as a senior researcher in air and water and treatment technologies at, UN, at the UNSW and the Carl Schuh, and I'm sorry if I've said that wrong, Institute of Technology in Germany. He joined Geoscience Australia in 2008 and developed and led a research program to evaluate monitoring techniques for geological storage of carbon dioxide 
Andrew now leads GA's efforts supporting implementation of the National Hydrogen Strategy. Please welcome Laura and Andrew. Okay, well, thank you so much, Christina, and welcome everyone um, here in person and also online. We have a fantastic attendance this morning, so I'm very excited uh, to be running through for you today, uh, my colleague Andrew and I, how Geoscience Australia is mapping Australia's hydrogen future. And so we'll be doing this uh, by also releasing our Hydrogen Economic Fairways tool, which we're very excited about. So I'll just flip to the next slide. Okay. But first of all, there are some very important people that we need to thank that have made this work possible because without their help, we would not be here today to actually uh, deliver this data product to you. So the very first person is uh, Stuart Walsh from Monash University. Stuart is the absolute brains behind uh, this tool. And so we've worked very closely with Stuart and we really thank you for all your um, contributions so far. Also to Chang Long from Monash, he's recently joined the team and has also been a key factor in delivering this today. And then also to my Geoscience Australia colleagues, uh, Marcus, Joseph, Murray, Mahina, Simon, Behan, and the Flying Hellfish team who are our web development team here at Geoscience Australia. Their work and their help has been um, incredible. So thank you all. So the way we're gonna run the session is to uh, pose three questions for you. And then Andrew and I are gonna dissect the questions and hopefully provide some answers to you along the way. So first is hydrogen. Why are we even interested? And so what I'm gonna go into here is uh, where does hydrogen fit into the energy economy at the moment? Where perhaps will hydrogen be used in the future? And also what is Geoscience Australia doing in this space right now? The next question is, well, where are the best regions for hydrogen production? And this is where I get to talk about HEFT, or Hydrogen Economic Fairways tool, uh, which Christina mentioned is a online geospatial mapping tool that will really help uh, users like yourselves uh, look at the economic viability of hydrogen production in Australia. And so we really foresee this tool being very useful to policymakers and potential investors, as it will really provide some information on perhaps best locations for hydrogen hubs and also infrastructure requirements um, for this development. But I'll dive right into what that means um, as we go through. And finally, uh, I'll hand over to Andrew and he will be going into what's next for hydrogen at Geoscience Australia, where we're now looking underground and going well, where perhaps can we store large scale uh, quantities of hydrogen in the future. So the first thing I want to do is, is really just set um, the scene and provide some context as to why we're interested in hydrogen. And so I just want to draw your attention to the um, figure or the graph on the, that's your left side of the screen. Um, and we can look at, first thing, well, I noticed two things when I first look at this. One is that global energy demand has been increasing for the past 20 years, and we foresee that continuing to increase into the future. The other really striking thing is the fact that coal, gas and oil all make up a very large percentage of this energy consumption. And so coal, gas and oil are all fossil fuels and we know when they're used for energy, they release CO2 emissions. So at the top, we can see that renewables is starting to make its appearance in the global energy mix, which is really, really great. Um, they are not, they don't release any harmful emissions when used. However, they've got a long way to go to really meet this demand that we see down here that's going to be increasing. So the great thing that hydrogen can do is it's an additional clean energy technology that can actually complement renewable energy. And so the reason it can complement it is because it can actually act as a storage system, but also can decarbonize some, some certain areas that perhaps renewables can't. So uh, for example, the steel making industry and also heavy vehicle industries such as uh, shipping and trucks. So it's got a lot of applications that really complement renewables, which is why we're really interested uh, in this story um, of hydrogen and its sort of role in the future energy mix of decarbonisation. So I think a great place to sort of wind back to and start with is, well, what is hydrogen? So if we think back to our um, periodic table from high school, 
the number one or the first element there was hydrogen, and that is because it is the lightest element on Earth. It makes up about 75% of the universe's mass, so there is a lot of it going around, uh, and it's most commonly found as a gas. And so when we're referring to hydrogen as an energy source, we're referring to hydrogen gas, and you can see that in the schematic here on the right, there's two hydrogen atoms that are bonded together. So that's where we get that H2 from. So when we say H2, you see that throughout the presentation, that's referring to hydrogen gas. So we know we have a lot of hydrogen. So where on earth do we find it? So I've got some um, pictures here of some potential sources. Uh, so on the far side, we have uh, the sun. This is 70% hydrogen, but perhaps a little bit inhospitable as a hydrogen source. Uh, so maybe not the best place to look at the start. We also have the Earth here, which is a very small percentage of hydrogen in the atmosphere. So perhaps atmospheric hydrogen is not overly useful to us either. What we do have a lot of on Earth is water. And so that H and the H2O, that is hydrogen. And so what we can do is actually split water and release the hydrogen that way and then use it as a fuel. So some planned uses for hydrogen in Australia. Uh, we have transport at the top there, which is, um, so like I said earlier, hydrogen can be used to really decarbonise trucks, uh, shipping, rails, that real heavy industry that perhaps um, batteries may not be able to cover completely. We have gas blending as well. Um, at the moment, there's a lot of pilot projects or a few pilot projects in Australia where they're actually injecting hydrogen gas into the natural gas network. And so perhaps you might one day be cooking uh, on your stovetop and using hydrogen gas to actually do your cooking for you. So that's a really exciting um, way to decarbonise the um, natural gas network. We've also got export down the bottom. Uh, Australia is being looked at as a, a large provider, perhaps to other countries for export of hydrogen. So not only can we potentially decarbonise our own energy sector, but perhaps other countries overseas as well. And then finally, we have ammonia production down the bottom. And so hydrogen is a key component of ammonia and ammonia is used, um, well, it's a very large product or very important sorry, product for fertilisers. So that's a really huge industry and it's a really important one to decarbonise through clean hydrogen as well. So how do we produce clean hydrogen? So let's start with this slide to just really clarify what our terms are that we're going to use because it can get a bit tricky or a bit confusing. Uh, so when we say clean hydrogen, we're referring to anything that falls um, into either renewable hydrogen or CCS hydrogen. And I'll explain what they are in just a moment, but it's important to just sort of understand this is what we're referring to. So clean hydrogen, renewable hydrogen, CCS hydrogen. Renewable hydrogen can also be referred to as green hydrogen. And CCS hydrogen is also referred to as blue hydrogen. So apologies if we mix up the names as we go through. So we'll start with renewable hydrogen production. How does it actually work? So renewable hydrogen production is um, based on using an electrolyzer. So in the middle here, we have a bit of a schematic of an electrolyzer. And what it does is water is fed into the electrolyzer. And it goes through a process of electrolysis, which requires a large amount of electricity. And so what that electricity does is sort of zaps the water and then it splits the hydrogen from the oxygen. And at the end, we have free hydrogen and free oxygen. Now, the way that makes this renewable or green is based on the fact that this is using electricity from renewable energy. So solar, wind, um, etc. So that's, yeah. That is uh, electrolysis for renewable hydrogen. The other way that we're going to um, discuss, or another way we can produce hydrogen, is through CCS or CCS hydrogen. And so, what this is is actually using um, some fossil fuels, so steam, uh, so gas and coal, perhaps, and going through a chemical process in a chemical plant where hydrogen is actually freed from coal or freed from gas and then used as a fuel, and then as a byproduct, we have CCS. And it's important to note that water is also included in this reaction. And so the important thing to note with this to make it clean is that we need to do something with this release CO2. And so what makes this um, a clean hydrogen process is the fact that that CCS is then captured 
and then um, fed underground into geological formations or rock formations that can actually house that CO2 into the future. So we're actually um, using fossil fuels but then drawing down that CO2 at the end to ensure it's a clean process. And some uh, references you'll see along the way, um, steam methane reformation plus CCS. This is referring to using gas as your um, energy source, or you might see coal gasification plus CCS, so using black and brown coal. So as, as Christina mentioned earlier, um, at Geoscience Australia, we are supporting the National Hydrogen Strategy. And the National Hydrogen Strategy is designed to establish Australia's hydrogen industry as a major global player by 2030. So that's where we sort of fit into the hydrogen story. And some of the ways we've supported the strategy so far is um, the first, I'll just draw attention to the, the picture of the prospective hydrogen production regions of Australia document. And this is a document um, or report that Andrew and other colleagues at GA put together and that actually contributed to the strategy. And so that was a really important um, contribution from Geoscience Australia. And what also came from that was a bunch of data and then um, that actually mapped out different hydrogen prospectivity scenarios across the country. That was then put, built into our new, um, well, it's not so new now, but it was at the time, Australia's Hydrogen Opportunities Tool, or better known as OzH2. And so in OzH2, we have um, hydrogen data layers that you can use to do your own sort of geospatial analysis or mapping in the hydrogen space. We have the hydrogen mapper function as well, which maps the prospectivity of hydrogen in Australia. And we now have the addition of the Hydrogen Economic Fairways 2 to OzH2, which is very cool. And so here's just an example of um, what OzH2 looks like and just an example of the front screen as you come in to the... There we go. So as we come into OzH2, this is the front landing page. I just want to show you what it looks like to get a bit of a feel for it. And so on the front page, we have um, Australia with lots of little coloured dots around the place. Now, these coloured dots uh, refer to hydrogen projects that are currently in operation or under construction or in development in Australia. And so that's a really good way to um, actually get an idea or a geospatial look at perhaps where a natural hydrogen hub's already forming um, from different groups building up their own pilot projects and starting to sort of invest in this hydrogen industry. Another thing I want to show on OzH2 is just a way you can layer up the um, geospatial maps to sort of build your own story. So this is just a very simple example. Using the layers function on the left, uh, we have, I've just added here, electricity transmission lines, which are these coloured wiggles across the place. And also the little anchors are some identified ports across Australia, which could be used as hydrogen export ports. So you might be interested in going, well, where is, how did the ports connect to electricity transmission lines for my hydrogen production? This is a very basic scenario of how you can sort of build up layers and build your own geospatial story. And also at the top here, this is where heft is coming. So we've had a run through of um, hydrogen and what we're doing in this space. And so I just wanted to take another step back and just kind of ask the question of, well, why now for clean hydrogen? So we hear a lot, well, I've heard a lot in the media, it's kind of a buzzword right now, hydrogen. Um, but has it been tried before? Like what is special about, you know, this 2020, 2021, we were talking about it a lot. And I reference a past presentation from Andrew, which was, um, had this great quote from Jules Verne in it. And I bring up Jules Verne, who was a, um, science fiction author, French science fiction author from the 1800s, and he was quite the visionary. A lot of his visions have actually come into reality. And I just want to read you this little snippet. Water will one day be employed as fuel, but hydrogen and oxygen which constitute it, used singly or together, will furnish an inexhaustible source of heat and light of an intensity of which coal is not capable. So it's not all on the money there, but he definitely had a vision that hydrogen would one day be a fuel source. And, you know, we're very close. This could actually be a reality. And I did look back in the future and go, well, has, have people tried this before? Has hydrogen tried to be um, implemented into our society? And with a bit of digging, I found this, um, this great picture of a 1974 Datsun B210. It was also called Sunny. And uh, Sunny was powered by liquid hydrogen, which is 
pretty awesome, uh, but we don't see any sunnies on the road, right? So, uh, and, and there's a very clear reason for that. And that's because hydrogen just hasn't been able to cost compete or be cost competitive with fossil fuels. So as, as much as it's a great idea, it just hasn't been able to compete with what's been um, our major fuel source for so long. But things are changing. And that's because the economics are now starting to stack up. And that has a lot to do with the um, cost of technologies coming down, such as renewable energy technology and CCS technology. And this is a really nice segue into the HEPT tool where we can actually demonstrate the economics and how it's actually starting to work out now for hydrogen. Which leads me to here. So we've answered our first question, why are we interested in hydrogen? And now we're gonna look at well, where are the best regions for hydrogen production? So HEFT, the Hydrogen Economic Fairways tool, again, it's a free and online mapping tool that allows you to map the economic viability of hydrogen production in Australia. And it not only assesses the quality of energy resources required to um, produce clean hydrogen, but it also considers associated infrastructure and water. So I'm just gonna walk you through this slide. I appreciate it's, it could be, it's a little bit busy, but it's a really good way to sort of understand what the tool is doing in the background. So we'll start here on the side um, with hydrogen costs. So what the tool is doing is actually taking the cost of a hydrogen plant, for example, an electrolyzer, and pulling all those, um, those costs together to build up a story of how much my hydrogen plant will actually cost. Next, we're gonna consider, or it considers, the energy source that we're gonna to use to actually run this hydrogen plant. So perhaps we wanna use, um, my mouse back, renewable energy, or perhaps we wanna use gas or coal. So we look at the cost of actually setting up one of those plants um, or a farm to actually uh, power a hydrogen plant. Next, we have the water. Uh, where is our water source coming from? It's really important that we have water. We can't actually produce hydrogen without it. And finally, if we're going down the road of um, CCS hydrogen, where are our storage basins? Where are the CCS pipelines where we can actually transport the um, CC or the CO2 to a basin for it to be stored underground and sealed away? So really important things that the tool takes into consideration. It not only takes into consideration cost, but also proximity to where your potential hydrogen plant is. So it's having a geospatial look um, around the country. Next, we're gonna have some hydrogen produced. This is fantastic, but we actually wanna to get to market. We wanna make some money. So the next thing it's gonna do is actually look at, well, we need to transport it to, for example, export. Well, what system do we wanna use? What's the cheapest? So it actually considers road, pipeline and road as different options for transporting your hydrogen. And what it will do is actually pick the most efficient and then feed that into the model. And then your final calculation um, for potential hydrogen costs, when it's sent to port, is released at the end. And I just want to touch back on the top here. In the top left corner, the tool also considers um, is there road or rail infrastructure that can connect your potential hydrogen plant and your potential energy source to current um, you know, urban centres or current areas. So you might want to build a, a hydrogen plant in the middle of, I don't know, the desert somewhere, but there's actually no roads to get into that hydrogen plant. So that will also calculate those costs in there as well. So finally, we're at the end, we're at export. And so what the tool actually gives us is a map and a net present value or NPV. And so just for the purpose of, of this um, seminar, I'm not going to go right into what NPV is, but essentially in the, in the context of hydrogen in this tool, uh, MPV is a financial calculation that can be used uh, to determine if a potential investment such as a hydrogen plant will be economic or not. And so the MPV for this tool represents economically favourable and unfavourable locations for hydrogen development. And I'll touch on that again as we go through. So the, interest, the really important part to highlight is that the tool is underwritten by um, the Blue Cap Economic Model or Blue Cap Code. And this is what's written at Monash. Uh, it's an open source tool for assessing resource potential. So it's written in Python, uh, employs national scale data sets. Cust it's customizable, you can use it online and offline. And there's ongoing support from us and Monash if you're wanting to use this code. And so it is open source. You can go to Bitbucket and actually download the code. Uh, Bitbucket, Geoscience Australia, Blue Cap. Hydrogen isn't yet in 
the um, blue cap code. It's still um, it's um, got the minerals aspect uh, in the code at the moment, which is where the economic fairways originally came from. But um, the hydrogen will be added shortly. In the uh, so watch this space. And if you'd like to know more about the code and um, other bits and pieces about uh, how it's been used before, I do encourage you to go and uh, read these papers. Walsh et al. 2020, Haynes et al. 2020. And so I'll dive into what the code is actually doing uh, and then also looking at some assessments of how economic fairways has been used for minerals in Northern Australia. We also have a paper submitted to uh, energy policy and that's currently in review uh, and hopefully that will be out um, in the coming few months. So back to the Economic Fairways tool and what we um, can show you and you can use on the Geoscience Australia website is when we use the tool, we're looking at a national assessment of hydrogen production. So remembering that the tool takes into consideration um, lots like water supply, infrastructure, transportation. We also set it up so it maps out certain scenarios for you or certain energy inputs. So for the renewable hydrogen scenarios, we have gone with a wind sole, so you're powering your hydrogen plant with wind. A solely solar um, scenario or a hybrid wind and solar. So you're actually powering your um, hydrogen plant with a hybrid wind and solar energy farm. For our CCS sources, we've got the steam, methane reformation or gas plus CCS scenario and coal gasification plus CCS scenario. And just to highlight what's on the bottom here, it's a bit more on what that first slide about economic fairways was, but we do our hydrogen research and we get all the economic data. We analyze it and do some funky graphs and maths and, and economic modeling. And then we overlay it with capacity factor, which is referring to this map here. And I'll explain that in the next slide, what that's all about and infrastructure. So distance to certain infrastructure. And this map down here is just showing you um, distance to potential road corridors in Australia. So they overlay with that information. And at the end, you have economic potential and your net present value. So renewable hydrogen considerations. And this is a capacity factor where that comes in. And capacity factor is very important for the renewable hydrogen, hydrogen considerations because capacity factor tells you how much electricity, I guess, you'll be able to gain from your particular renewable energy farm. So capacity factor itself is essentially a measure of your actual electricity output or your actual output compared to the maximum possible output of that particular farm. So I'll give you a workable example. Um, you might have a 10 megawatt solar farm which is fantastic, but you're, you're unlikely to ever produce 10 megawatts electricity because the sun does not shine 24 hours a day and you might have days where it's a little bit cloudy. So your capacity factor is how much of that time you're actually able to produce electricity. And so it's really important to know that because if we know our capacity factors across Australia for different resources, we can then determine how much electricity we have, do we have available to us to produce renewable hydrogen. As so these maps are new, I'm very excited to release these as well. Um, so Stuart from Monash and myself and Andrew have worked together to actually build new capacity factor maps for Australia. And these are all online and, and please download them and, and use them in your own software. And, and so we have the solar pho photovoltaic um, map here. Uh, the pink is showing the areas of higher capacity factor, growing from the down through the blue. So the maximum capacity factor is 5%. Our concentrated solar power um, in the middle here with a maximum of 62%. And then wind and the 150 metre hub height refers to how tall your wind turbine is. Um, and again, we see a 42% maximum capacity factor for the wind highlighted in the pinks. We also have uh, a higher wind and solar capacity factor map. And we're not aware of anywhere else having this open source. We're so excited to get this out to you. Uh, and this is actually mapping, you know, if you had a combined wind and solar farm. Um, and the reason you might want to do that is because you can actually up your capacity factor by mixing solar with wind. And that's because you might have um, a better wind resource at night. And again, we know that the sun only shines during the day. So if you couple those together, then you can actually up your capacity factor and again, produce more electricity to um, power your um, hydrogen plant. And so we can see the maximum here is with that combined um, effort is 64% for 
for a 50% wind, 50% solar farm. Now, considerations for CCS hydrogen. Uh, this is, um, we need to really look at, well, perhaps where are our CCS basins, or carbon capture and storage basins? And they're highlighted in green in the map. And so this is not an exhaustive list of CCS basins. There are others out there which have the potential to actually um, capture and hold on to CO2. But these basins are just the ones that are highly characterised uh, and that we know are capable of um, CCS. So we want to know where they are so we know where we, how far it is we have to actually transport our CO2 um, if we're producing CCS hydrogen. And also, you can see in the black here, we've got gas pipelines as an example. We need to know where our gas is coming from. So where is our gas source? And, you know, if you've got coal, well, where perhaps are our coal mines? So uh, distance or proximity to um, your energy source is also really important to consider. Okay. So I've run you through the tool. Um, I'm going to try a live demonstration. We'll see how it goes. So I'd really love to show you all where the tool sits and how it works on OzH2. So, oops, sorry. So you can go through and use it yourself. Let's just refresh. Great. So OzH2, this is your landing page. And as I mentioned before, we've got our hydrogen projects on the map here. And the first thing I want to show is where the capacity factor maps live and also where you can download them from. So under layers, map layers, if we head down to renewable energy, capacity factor maps, here they all are for you to add to the map as you like. I'm just going to give one example. Um, we we'll use the one I showed before. So 50-50 um, hybrid wind and solar. So you add that to the map and there you go. Voila. You can also get a point location of how much capacity factor is in a certain spot. So you might be interested in up here because it looks, you know, pretty, pretty good. So you just hit, you click that there and you're actually given a capacity factor value there. So that's really useful um, for overlaying that again with other um, map layers in the tool. So I'll remove that. So this is where our maps are. So please go ahead and play with them and have a look. I'll also just show you. If you'd like to download them and use them in your own spatial software, we have a zip file of geotiffs that you can use. So up here in data and publications, data packages, hydrogen, renewable energy capacity factor maps, and we hit the download here and you're given the zip file. So yeah, um, they're all there for you to use and we're really encouraging you to um, use them if you're after that information. Oops, no, I don't want to download. Um, <laughs> There you go, it works. Um, all right, so now we've done layers. More importantly, what we're all interested in mostly is the economic fairways tool. So we'll just close this one, swing Australia back this way. Now, if we're interested in the economic fairways portal, we hit tools on the top here, down to economic fairways mapper, and here we have hydrogen. So the first thing we're gonna look at is it sort of steps you through. So where's your energy source from? What is your hydrogen plant consisting of? And then how are we getting it to port? So the first thing you wanna do is actually select an area to map. So if you hit the manual button here, you get an entire sort of national scale assessment. Our energy input. So I just drop this down. Now all those scenarios I mentioned previously as our energy source for hydrogen, they're listed here. So we've got solar, concentrated solar power, wind, hybrid wind and solar, and then we have down the bottom here our CCS hydrogen options. Now you see this little sort of pop-up box coming up. These are our tool tips. We've just added them through the tool to um, just give a bit more information of where data is coming from and perhaps explain things that aren't overly um, intuitive. So let's just stay with hybrid wind and solar as an example. The next thing we have here is renewable energy capacity factor. So we can actually toggle on and off the map by hitting this little globe. And here's the map here. And you'll notice it's just, it looks a little different to that past map that we had. And that's because the stretch type of the color is a little different. And that's because we wanted to emphasize um, the fact that the 50% wind and solar ratio is actually the best ratio for hybrid wind and solar from the maps that we've found. 
and I'll, I'll show you how that works. So we've set this map on an absolute scale, so it means that all the maps of all ratios will uh, have a maximum capacity factor of 64% and a minimum of 25%. And this will become quite clear as I flip through the sliders. So say you want to change your ratio to 40% wind, 60% solar or something. Yes, that's right. The colours are going less pink. So we're moving away from an as high capacity factor. Same with 30, 70, the other way. And we can also go, for example, let's have more wind than solar. It's good, but still not as good as that 50%, 50% ratio. That's a cool functionality we added in there. Um, so we'll remove that. We'll stay with 50% um, because we know that's the best. So we set our renewable energy capacity factor. Next, we're going to look at our hydrogen plant. So the year of operations. We've used Bloomberg data, so Bloomberg New Energy Finance, and we've been able to use um, some of their forecasting forward, so 2030 and 2050. And so what this is actually forecasting is the cost of your electrolyzer in the future. So it's cool we've added that functionality. You can actually look at well, what's the price today and how does that change with the change in electrolyzer cost in the future. So we'll stay with 2021. The next thing is our electrolysis system capex. And what this really refers to is how much is it going to cost you to buy and install your electrolyzer and then run it. So we've got five options ranging from 200 US dollars per kilowatt through to $1,400 per kilowatt. Again, all from that Bloomberg data um, and ranging between alkaline and um, PEM electrolyzers. So you have options here. Uh, I'll select the $1,200 as the, the established, well, established supplier I should actually mention is referring to sort of Western made or um, European suppliers. So they've been producing electrolyzers for a long time. And when we refer here to emerging supplier, this is some new um, groups coming out of Asia, which has some really sort of exciting costs that are a lot lower um, than much new suppliers as the system is emerging. So we've set our capex of our electrolyzer. Next, we want to go to our water source. And so we have a choice between desalinated water and potable water. Uh, desalinated water is taking like ocean water and removing the impurities so we have um, water left over or clear um, pure water and potable water is um, tap water. So we'll just stick with desalinated. You can tweak through the cost of your water, but this is a cost we've um, found from research, $0.01 per um, kilo of hydrogen, so we'll stay there. Your amount of hydrogen produced, uh, you can range between 1,500 tonnes a day, that's very large scale um, export um, capacity, or right down to, say, a smaller um, production of one tonne a day. So you've really got options there. We'll stay around the 800 mark. You can change the operating life of your plant, but 25 years is pretty standard. But so now we've, um, we've set the parameters of our hydrogen plant. We're next going to move to the um, end point. So this is, are we going to send our hydrogen to port or are we going to keep it at the actual hydrogen plant? Um, some people, you know, there's, yeah, it's, it can be interesting to see how much the cost of transport can add to your overall cost of hydrogen. So it's useful to have that functionality. We'll stay with the nearest suitable port. And then we can tweak. We can also tweak the company discount rate. It's set as 5% as a standard uh, currency. You can tweak between Australian and US dollars. And finally, the target hydrogen price is. Um, what you'd like to sell your hydrogen for at market. And that's because we don't, oh, um, at the port, sorry. And that's because there's no sort of current market price for hydrogen, no spot price. And that's uh, because you know, hydrogen's a new commodity. It's not really at that point yet where it's got um, its own sort of market price. So this is, you can put whatever it is up to your heart's content in here, uh, between $1 and $10, $4 is a great place to start. And finally, we have the net present value calculation that we run. And again, that's looking at um, you know, what areas are potentially economic for hydrogen and what areas are not so economic for hydrogen based on NPV. So we run our assessment. And uh, what we'll see as it comes up is a map of um, a very easily contrasting map of blues, reds, and white. And so the red on the right here is um, our positive NPV 
PV. So what this means is these areas are potentially, based on these inputs, economic for hydrogen production, which is really cool. Uh, and the white is areas where this cost breaks even, your NPV is zero, and the blue is very distinct that based on these inputs in this scenario, these regions of Australia are perhaps not economic for hydrogen production and perhaps aren't then good investments. So it's a really clear map straight away of regions that are good for um, development of hydrogen and regions that perhaps you might want to, um, you know, look deeper in or perhaps avoid. Um, so we can also query point here and actually get a point location. And what that does is I've clicked over here in the Pilbara area. You get a latitude, longitude um, down the bottom and also a specific NPV to that location. So that's the functionality and how it works. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to move back to the presentation. Um, I'll quickly show you one more. I've got, I've got one minute, so I'm going, to, I'm going to whiz through it. I just want to show you the blue hydrogen scenario. Uh, I'm just conscious of time. So what I'll do is we've got ductive renewable hydrogen setting. Now we're back to the map. Let's change the, um, the goalpost a bit and actually look at a specific area. So let's clear extent. And we're going to hang on. There we go. I always get that confused. So you want to draw extent and then click on the button that tells you to do that. Um, let's look at Victoria, for example, for CCS hydrogen. So we pick our location. And now we're going to change the energy input to steam, methane, reformation, and CCS. So we're looking at gas plus CCS. It's a little different. Uh, it removes the hydrogen plant electrolyzer um, bits and pieces. What you are left with to change is a natural gas class. So $8, that's where we're going to set it at. Um, we'll keep the endpoint as suitable port. Everything else remains the same, except our hydrogen price um, is a little different. So we might want to put that down to $3.20, for example. Again, we run our assessment. And what we should get is a nice localised map here of Victoria showing us the um, hydrogen production potential. There we go. So there we can see... Um, this is that area. Reds are good. Blues are not so great for that particular specific scenario. So that's the Oz H2. I'm going to move back to the um, slides now. There we go. And so to wrap up, I just want to show you some preliminary findings uh, for renewable hydrogen. On the map, we can see here um, that's that wind and solar scenario that you saw before. And um, I just wanted to highlight that some initial findings we've found is that the transport costs can really um, influence your final NPV or your final economic viability for hydrogen. So the blue here, key freight routes, you can see that all the reds sort of centralising where the ports are located and an example where your freight routes are. And so it's really highlighting the story that, you know, that transport cost is really sort of contributing to that overall production cost of hydrogen. Similarly, with CCS hydrogen, um, the areas where we have our best uh, prospectivity or economic viability, it's locating around where your basins are for CCS storage, your ports, and also where your gas pipelines lie. So it's more to discover. There's only some new stuff we've found, but it's certainly painting that story that transport costs really do add to that um, final hydrogen cost. Finally, what's up next for HEFT? We've got this first iteration out, which is fantastic, but we're not stopping here. Um, next, we want to add in hydroelectricity energy to the mix. So perhaps you want to run your hydrogen plant using hydropower or pumped hydro, but also hybrid wind and hydro. We're going to add some export options. Uh, you might want to see what the cost is by um, actually converting your hydrogen to ammonia at the port or actually liquefied hydrogen at the port. So adding that in as well, which will really build that export story. We'll add battery storage to look at how you can actually capture some of that extra energy from a hybrid wind and solar plant, for example, and also hydrogen storage um, looking underground, which is what Andrew will be telling us about right now. And the final thing here is grid-connected hydrogen we're adding. Uh, and this is a parallel project between Monash and Woodside, and so that will be added to the tool in the future as well. All righty, so thank you, and I'll hand over to Andrew now.
Okay, well, thanks very much, Laura, and uh, good afternoon to everyone on the line, or good morning. Um, look, what's next for hydrogen and geoscience Australia? Well, we're going to be looking for underground storage options for hydrogen, and storage is really important, which I'm going to touch on over the next couple of slides. So if Australia is going to produce, use, and export hydrogen, we're going to need to be able to store it, and we're going to need to be able to store for a fair bit of it, actually. Storage provides a buffer in case of unexpected high demand. Um, high seasonal demand, you can imagine that during winter, if you're heating, say down in southern Australia, you need hydrogen um, compared to summer demand, so the demand could be different. And also potentially um, intermittent production of hydrogen when using renewable energy. So, for example, you know, we've experienced this last week, a period of really intense rain across eastern Australia, right? And, you know, it's not going to be that great for solar production of hydrogen. So being able to store hydrogen to ride out those changes in energy and renewable capacity will be really important. Right. So um, just like for natural gas, to store large volumes of hydrogen, Really, the best option is underground storage. Uh, this is the most practical way and cost-effective way of storing large amounts of hydrogen. And countries that are serious about um, transitioning across to hydrogen are all looking at what are their storage options. We currently do this in Australia for natural gas. So for natural gas in Australia, we store, you know, well, we have the capacity to store about 5 million tonnes of natural gas in underground storage in eight sites across Australia. Um, natural gas is stored in depleted reservoirs, and these are typically thick layers. So uh, for those people who are unfamiliar with this, these are typically thick layers of sandstone rock deep underground. And what you do is you get the gas and you push it into the little spaces between the grains and sandstone rock, and that's where the gas is stored. Um, and one way to kind of think about this is, you know, if you drop water or you're standing, you've just gotten out of the ocean, you've gone for a snorkel, and you're standing on a sandstone rock and the water that is dripping onto you is dripping, soaking into the sandstone rock. So it's similar with gases, they can soak into rocks also, or you can push them into rocks. Another option is salt storage caverns. And these are created by creating a void in thick layers of underground sock, uh, sock, salt. Salt is much better. Um, uh, and you've probably come across this rock salt and those pretty pink Himalayan rock salt candles you get in hippie shops. You know, and apparently if you lick them, it gives you superpowers or something. But no, um, that that stuff is that that's the rock that's or the salt that is trapped deep underground and we can create caverns in that type of rock. Um, these caverns are not especially big, unlike, you know, geological storage, where it's talking about really large storage volumes. It could be about 100 metres across in diameter, and, you know, sort of one, two, maybe 300 metres in the uh, So Yeah, it's hard to imagine, but these salt deposits can be really thick, you know, up to 800 metres thick in parts of Australia. On the image here, we've also got depleted um, uh, aquifers. So it's basically a depleted gas field, except it's never had... Um, uh, just accumulated in it and it's flooded with water. Another option is hard rock mining. And this is something that we do in Australia quite a lot, right, for mining for minerals and things, is you actually could mine out a void in some hard rock. And then you could line that with plastics or stainless steel and create like a secure hydrogen storage facility in that type of um, system. Right. So that all said, Internationally, if we're talking about commercial scale storage of hydrogen, that is all currently done in salt. So we know that works and that's been happening for decades. Um, there is currently no commercial storage of hydrogen, of pure hydrogen in depleted gas reservoirs. So there are pilot projects around the, around the world which are developing up um, uh, to prove it, which is fantastic, but there's uh, currently no um, projects around the world that are actually doing that. Uh, now, I, I guess there's, there's a kind of view developing, I think, that we can just store hydrogen into depleted gas reservoirs. Um, and hopefully, 
you know, that is an option. But there are a couple of reasons why maybe you need to, you know, maybe it's not going to be that straightforward. One of the reasons is microbes. So micro, you know, hydrogen is a rich energy source and microbes love it. So they're going to grow and they could potentially biofoul or stuff to clog up a reservoir if there's lots of hydrogen um, in there. But, another, but I guess the other key issue is just where these things are located. So if we go to this slide here, so this slide is showing um, in green where we currently have underground storage of natural gas and depleted reservoirs. Red shows depleted reservoirs around the place and um, the yellow regions are showing where we're currently extracting gas around, uh, around Australia. Now I think one of the things that's kind of striking with this is maybe it doesn't seem to be as much as you might think it might be, right? Um, when you look at this map. And I guess that's part of the issue is that they are located, the, the depleted gas reservoirs are naturally located where they're producing gas. But that's really quite geographically um, restricted in those areas. So on the, this other map here, this is a map showing where are the most prospective areas for hydrogen production using renewable energy production, green hydrogen. And you can see that the most prospective areas don't necessarily line up where, we're, where we have to put a gas reservoirs. And so this is kind of an issue that we need to think about. So you've got areas in North Queensland, the NT down in Adelaide, uh, New South Wales, and even in the Pilbara, but we don't necessarily have to put gas reservoirs there. So what other options do we have? Well, salt. Salt has been used overseas, and we know that that works really well. And this is a map of the salt resources that we currently know around Australia. The bright, lurid green plots you can see there, the Canning Basin, the Amadeus and the Outer Vale, that's where we know there is really thick onshore um, salt deposits. But there's other basins there which are highlighted, which also we know contain salt. So in the offshore, there's the Bonaparte basins, there's some super thick salt there, but it's super deep. And also in the polar basin there down in South Australia. But there's other basins there. And I guess that's one of the key issues is that we don't really have a good handle on salt resources across Australia. And that's what Geoscience Australia is going to be looking at over the next couple of years, is trying to answer that question, where are the really the good, the solid salt resources? And that's one of the things that we're considering under uh, the Exploring for the Future program, which is a large program that Geoscience Australia has, which is looking for new resource discoveries around Australia. So this includes groundwater, conventional and unconventional um, gas, and also mineral deposits, critical minerals. But um, we're trying to keep, also consider that salt as a resource under this program. When we're looking at exploring these different basins and you know, doing seismic surveys and drilling surveys, to have that, keep that in mind that we're also looking for salt. Salt is an important resource. And um, one of the things that we are doing under that program is using remote sensing techniques to look for salt. Now, this is an image here up sort of near Broome area in northwestern Australia. And it shows that, I hope you can see that purple dot in the middle of the screen there. Um, that is the location of a well that was drilled back in the 1950s, actually by Geoscience Australia's predecessor agency, the Bureau of Mineral Resources. And that well intersected a salt dip here. It's kind of like a column of salt. So you've got the big mother load of salt, which is really deep, and then it gets squished. And then you get this column of salt to make its way further up. And so that intercepted one of these columns of salt um, at about a depth of half a kilometre underground. And the only, you know, you can't tell from the landscape that there's this big salt feature buried underneath there, right? It's red sand dunes and um, this creek system nearby. But using geophysics, we can sort of peer underneath what we see on the ground surface to look at what could be potentially down there. And so this is an image here of gravity. That's the sort of greens and yellows. And then we also have uh, the stripes, with this, which are the um, electromagnetic um, survey lines where planes are flying over there. But the point is that we can combine lots of different data sets and test it on these known 
um, deposits to look for um, potential salt um, features. Probably don't have time to do that, but one of the things here was uh, one of my colleagues, you see weird things on underground, right? So this is, um, could be a potential impact crater, buried impact crater from an asteroid strike. It could be the top of a salt dome, or as one of my colleagues said, it could be a very low in space. So, you know, you didn't, until you go looking, you never know what you're going to find. Okay. Finally, look, I'm really running out of time. The other thing that GA is going to be doing is looking for natural geologic hydrogen. So, although Laura said at the beginning of the talk that there's not much free hydrogen that we see in the atmosphere and stuff, hydrogen is actually, we're finding more and more occurrences of hydrogen actually in the rocks as a gas. And so this project will be looking at trying to understand where that hydrogen comes from and what's the potential resource potential around Australia of that source. Okay, so finally, thanks very much for listening. It's, um, we're super excited to release this um, hydrogen economic fairways tool. Please use it. Please tell us what's great about it, what's not great about it, provide your feedback. And um, yeah, we're looking for salt out there for you and other storage options. So yeah, watch this space. Thanks very much. <laughs>
what releases so many CO2 emissions in the steelmaking process is actually the heating up of coal and this like sort of coking pro um, process. So you can actually replace that with hydrogen um, and actually use clean hydrogen to, to create that heat that you need to provide steel. So actually burning um, fossil fuels for energy wouldn't really provide you that hydrogen that you need for those sort of harder to abate sectors. Um, so it's a good question as far as why would we do it? Um, but it's because we need that hydrogen to do other bits and pieces in the energy economy uh, that fossil fuels just can't really do for us right now. Well, cleanly anyway. I'm going to call questions here, but I've got one more question online that I'll take and then we'll conclude. So apologies for those here that did have, have their hand up, but I'll just do this one last question, um, which is what is the likely scale range for such hydrogen storage sites? Range. In terms of uh, salt, or I guess this is the question. I think how, uh, how much you could store. So we don't need like really vast amounts of storage for hydrogen um, compared to, say, if you're capturing CO2 and um, geologically storing it. So the, the amount is much, much, much less. Um, However, it really depends on the region what option is available for storage. So, you know, in some areas it might be suitable, um, depleted gas fields might be suitable, some areas maybe salt might be suitable, but if those aren't suitable, then you're looking at different options. And that could be depleted um, aquifers, uh, saline aquifers, trying to find some sort of stratigraphic trap that could um, capture your hydrogen, or this hard rock mining type option of just basically digging out a hole in granite or something quite hard to store it. Okay, oh, you're up. Sorry, you're no. up. Okay, um, in that regard now, I'd like to conclude the seminar. Thank you everyone for participating. Thank you all online as well for your participation. It's nice to see such a turnout. Again, apologies we didn't get through all the questions that were. Just a reminder that next week, the Wednesday seminar will be on the second phase of the Exploring for the Future program. And Dr. Dr. Andrew Heap and Dr. Carol Charles Notter and myself will be discussing how Geoscience Australia's Exploring for the Future program is supporting a strong economy, a resilient society and sustainable environment. And we will be outlining our exciting three and a half year plan for integrated pre-competitive geoscience, which will support our minerals, energy and groundwater. Please join us again next week on the 31st of March. Thank you again. Thank <laughs> you.